We also have uh, Wellesley Media is live broadcasting tonight and they're recording the event. So you'll be able to see it on Wellesley Media's website at a later time. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Hal Phillips. I had no idea we're gonna be on TV as well. That's just another layer of anxiety. Um, so uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Hello to everyone. I wanted to thank the friends of the Wellesley Free Library, right? They're the ones who are sponsoring this. And Kara Rothman, of course, who organized this whole thing. Thank you so much. And thanks to Wellesley Books for offering the books for sale. They're not here. Okay. Well, what we needed. yes. Well, it's fine. Um, if you've not purchased Generation Zero, well, that's why we're here, why they're here. Um, my book of it is available at all the proverbial finer independent bookstores everywhere. Um, but it's a beautiful thing when they come to you. Um, so I am the author of this book. Let me get rid of that thing. Uh, cancel. Oh, what's happened? There. That is the reason we're all here. Um, I should point out that I first played soccer over there at Honeywell School. Um, when I moved here from New Jersey, I'd never played soccer. It was 1973, never touched a soccer ball. And um, I just think it's sort of awesome that we're here to talk about this book so close to that space, which you were saying that they've built two floors. Well, I always thought that it looked weird that this building was two floors because you can actually see it from the playground at Wellesley, at Honeywell School. So now you're even. So that was the early 1970s when the US was um, undergoing something called the Youth Soccer Revolution. Um, and I have to say, um, it's pretty awesome that we're gathered here tonight in the 21st century talking about the making of soccer in America, so very close to a World Cup, so very close to where it all began. And um, it also began for several others here tonight. So welcome to everyone. There is, as you know, um, a World Cup looming. Um, I have us at roughly T minus 62 hours from Sunday's opening match. Uh, but before we get to tonight's international topic, Mr. Kieser, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the book, um, which was published in July. It's full and complete name, Generation Zero, Founding Fathers, Hidden Histories, and the Making of Soccer in America. Um, I like to call it the, mar the modern creation epic, capital C, um, that U.S. soccer didn't really know it had um, because, you know, while fans of U.S. soccer can appreciate that we live today in a mature and rich soccer culture, um, and while older soccer folk remember that we grew up in a pretty soccer indifferent culture, um, even they don't really know how we got here. I didn't. And um, gener Generation Zero tells that story. It is, in fact, the first unified theory and history of how we got here. Um, my research and reporting started out as an exploration of the 1989 U.S. men's national team, the team that beat Trinidad and Tobago in Port of Spain and qualified for the 1990 World Cup. Paul Caligiuri, his shot hurt round the world, blah, blah, blah. Perhaps you're aware of this game, of this goal. It really did change everything. It enabled and inaugurated what I call the modern American soccer movement, which includes everything we enjoy today in our rich and diverse soccer culture. Incidentally, the shot here comes courtesy of the official um, U.S. Soccer Federation photographer um, in 1989. His name is John Van Weerden, and um, his, his pictures are all over my book. He was very kind making them available to me. Um, this shot was taken about 15 seconds after Paul Caligiuri scored that goal. And he is right there. So. This shot was taken 15 seconds into the modern American soccer movement. Um, sports do tend to require these sort of explicative, quick-hitting narratives, these touchstones that tell us how we got here. Um, yet this single goal did produce everything we would expect um, in a mainstream soccer culture. And um, these are things we did not have in 1989, like a proper first division, um, a national women's soccer league. We didn't have routine World Cup qualifications. Um, we didn't have live matches 
beamed into our households from all over the world every day. We didn't have US players competing in Europe's top leagues. Um, and we didn't have American ownership of iconic clubs in those leagues. All those things exist today because of this team. Um, vitally, um, that goal also delivered one World Cup in Italy, then another here in 1994. And um, a lot of people don't realize that the US, the US may not have hosted the 1994 World Cup if we hadn't qualified for the Italian World Cup in 1990. Um, for that tasty bit of historical gossip, however, you will need to buy and read the book. But why was competing in an international tournament, this particular World Cup, so important? That's the formal subject of my talk tonight. Um, but just to set the scene a little bit more, um, when I started researching the um, 1989 US men's national team, let me just forward these pictures there. I discovered that all these guys belong to Generation X, um, the cohort of Americans born between 1961 and 1981. Um, full disclosure, I'm a Gen Xer myself. Uh, upon speaking to them, I realized they understood their place in history. They understood that it all started with them. They were a little miffed that they didn't get the credit for that, which is always a good thing for a journalist to hear. Um, they also understood that soccer had been around in America since the 1870s and never really amounted to much. Um, all of a sudden, this particular cohort of American players and fans showed up and everything changes. But here's what they didn't understand. Why us? Why not the cohort of players five or ten years older? Um, my book answers those questions. It does so by fixating on a 20-year narrative arc one that explains how and why this particular generation of men and women born in the 1960s and raised on soccer in the 1970s were able to mainstream the sport of soccer in this country where all previous American generations had failed. For storytelling purposes, I renamed this Gen X cohort Generation Zero because everything really did start with them. The youth soccer revolution was a real thing. Um, it was a massive proliferation of youth soccer leagues, largely a suburban phenomenon that really covered the entire country, all 50 states. Um, and it did something specific. It created the country's first cohort of genuine soccer natives. You know, this is how we introduce sports to um, kids in this culture. They played Little League, they played Pee Wee football. Until in the 1970s, we never did this with soccer, which is really the reason it never mainstreamed itself, I discovered. Um, it took two full decades to happen, once the 70s, and you know, once the youth soccer revolution happened, but um, it did happen on a more or less narrative arc that didn't always bend toward progress, but it did happen, and it all came to a head in 1989. So we are living in the enviable American soccer reality that Generation Zero created, um, because it delivered both ends of the uh, critical formative equation. This golden generation of elite talent that could finally compete on the world stage. And I should add that Generation Zero includes the 1991 Women's World Champions. They are the same age as the 1989 team. It's all one generation of Americans. But Generation Zero produced this elite on-field talent, but it also produced us. It produced a bunch of people who all of a sudden knew soccer intimately. And that was really the first legitimate soccer fan base this country ever generated. So those millions of boys and girls who played in those youth leagues, it is they who sat up and took notice at Italian 90. It is they who made a success of World Cup 94 and uh, Major League Soccer, and today the National Women's Soccer League. It was their eyeballs that advertisers coveted when networks started beaming English, German, and Spanish league games into this country in 19. 95, 96, 97, um, and now they do it nearly every day of the week. Hmm. My fingers are really dry, but my forehead is not. So the title of my talk tonight is Soccer and America's Slow Embrace of Internationalism. We keep talking about World Cups, 
So it seems fair to address before we go any further why qualifying for a World Cup was so damned important to the growth and maturation of US soccer. Um, because if we think about it, the success of other sports here in America um, have never been dependent on our participation in international events. Um, first, during the mid to, 19, you know, mid to late 1980s, there was no National Soccer League operating in the US. Um, did anyone catch the MLS Cup final? That was two Sundays ago. Great game. Um, some 2.5 million Americans watched that game. Um, the North American Le uh, Soccer League formed in 1967, but went bust 17 years later, then disappeared. That was 1984. The second division, American Soccer League, expired the year before that. Think about the attention to soccer, specifically that Major League Soccer and the National Women's Soccer League generate today. Not just championship finals or playoffs, but entire seasons of league play. Think about the attention any league generates for its sport. None of that league apparatus existed here starting in 1984. As a result, soccer wasn't available anywhere on American television throughout most of the 1980s, only the indoor variety. And even then, only intermittently, very late at night, on fledging cable channels right after competitive bull riding. So American soccer fans, as, and we know they existed, right? Um, millions of 80s era young adults had learned the game in the 70s and had grown up. There was nowhere for these people to go see a game, and there was no physically outdoors and there was nowhere to watch the game on TV. So the World Cup at this time was really the only way Americans could really access the game, certainly on television. What's more, the World Cup was the only way the US soccer establishment could reach people um, and sell the game to them, if you will. Um, let me read a passage from Generation Zero. Even during the late 1960s, before and after the launch of NASL, the urgency of World Cup qualification was obvious. It was, in fact, central to the mantra repeated over and over again in NASL and US Soccer Federation circles throughout the 70s and the 80s. If we can just qualify the national team for a World Cup, they argued, the event will be on national TV for two weeks, and Americans, finally in the position to mobilize, mobilize their signature jingoism, will take or begin to take soccer into their hearts. There was just one problem. We couldn't qualify for a World Cup. Um, and this was the problem before, during, and after the NASL era. Our national teams from 1950 to 1990 simply weren't good enough. Um, formal qualification for the World Cup started before the 1954 World Cup. And from that point forward, we tried nine times to qualify for the World Cup and failed every single time. And it really wasn't even close, except for that first time. We never made it out of the preliminary stage. We never even made final qualifying in our confederation. So we were miles away. Um, there was demand for soccer at this time. I talked to more than 50 people in researching this book, many of them my contemporaries. I can tell you, I can't tell you how many of them said to me, I used to watch the Wide World of Sports you know, promo lead in just to see Pele jump into the arms of his teammates. And I was like, I, I did that too. Uh, uh, the Mexican World Cup of 1970 was a huge event. It was the first to be televised globally. It was the first to be televised in color. Um, it was the first ever held outside of Europe or South America. It was a big deal, and it was right next door. But twice, actually, Mexico hosted this soccer extravaganza. Neither time could the U.S. manage to qualify and enable the American viewing public to truly take part. Now, Generation Zero solved that problem, finally, in Port of Spain, Trinidad, on November 19, 1989. Now, November 19 is my sister's birthday. I just want to say it for the record. Big day. Yet there was another obstacle, something that uh, World Cup appearance or two could not solve on its own. The structure of soccer's appeal is unique, um, and that appeal is inextricably tied to the sport's internationalism. Now, you know, what does that mean? It means my country playing soccer against your country in another country. It means um, playing for a European championship or a world championship or just regional or border bragging rights. Um, it can mean our homegrown soccer players 
going to England or Germany and playing in their leagues. It can mean Germans coming to our league. It's integral, this internationalism to soccer's appeal. And, um, you know, it's really about going into enemy territory sometimes and playing and winning or losing. Um, but there's even more to this international dynamic. There's an identifiable way the Brazilians play the game of soccer. We know this today from watching them over the course of decades and from reading about them. Um, soccer alone allows us to contrast this or any national style with, for example, the way the Germans play or the Congolese or the Mexicans. Besides, it's, um, because it's the global game, every nation has a style of play or aspires to one. Um, Every nation has its own fierce rivals, cultural, geopolitical. All these things are offered up by the game, all these dynamics, with a greater breadth and diversity than any other sport I know of. And it's really the core of soccer's appeal. It's what makes it the world game. And America, until the late 1980s, didn't understand or appreciate these dynamics or their appeal at all. Today, we do. You can just look around at how the World Cup has been captured, um, has captured American imaginations in 2022, um, purely as an international spectacle. Um, in 12 days, the U.S. plays Iran. Who cannot see the geopolitical Sturm and Drang in that game? I mean, no other sport serves that up to us. Only soccer delivers it. However, through most of the 1980s, Americans didn't have this or any of these understandings at all where the rest of the world did. Why not, and why did it change? Prior to the late 1980s, fans here in the States followed sports, different teams and leagues, pretty much on a purely domestic basis. In large part, we still do. Our most popular sport, football, has no international component at all. I mean, no one plays it outside of our borders. Um, no one else plays it on the face of the earth, except the, except the Canadians, they play. Um, so that makes, World Cup style country versus country football games, impossible. So why would we think about those things? That's our most popular sport. Our second most popular sport traditionally has been Major League Baseball, um, where they vie for you know, World Series crowns, but no foreign leagues or teams take part. Um, they did experiment with something called the World Baseball Classic. Starting in 2006, um, it never really rose above exhibition status. This was a country versus country event. And a lot of countries play baseball, but it didn't catch on. It um, disappeared in 2013. The National Basketball Association, the NHL, their seasons and playoffs are contested entirely within the confines of North America. You don't want to use the word insular when you're talking about our sports culture because it's sort of judgmental. But it is striking how little interest we had in internationalism because everything was here. We didn't worry about what was happening in other countries. We didn't compete against them at all. Um, there's a useful phrase I should introduce here, domestic competitions. This is how the English, for example, refer to their football league, their many levels of soccer. Um, they call them domestic competitions because they need to distinguish them between domestic competitions and international competitions because they play as England, other countries in soccer and team handball and cricket, rugby. Um, when I first traveled abroad to England in the 1980s, only then did I understand the need to distinguish league play um, in this way because back home, all we had and all we really knew were domestic competitions. What about the Olympics, you may well ask? Well, they're international. And we always send teams to compete in basketball and hockey and team handball and field hockey. But these competitions were never the main attractions for Americans back home. If you think about it, for Olympic World Championship tournaments in the US and Canada, we always stock these teams, these national basketball teams and hockey teams with amateurs. We didn't value it. Um, the fans didn't seem to care whether we sent college kids. So that's what we did. Um, prior to 1990, I think also Americans followed Olympics very closely, but we typically conferred Olympic-derived celebrity status not on teams, but on individual Olympic champions. 
Um, think about the Olympic TV coverage prior to 1990. Think about the stars it produced. Sugar Ray Leonard, Joan Benoit Samuelson, Maynard, Peggy Fleming, Carl Lewis, Mary Lou Retton. I mean, you can go on and on. Um, we still hew to the individual in this way when it comes to the Olympic fame. Um, in America, it's primarily reserved for individual champions, and it can last a very long time. So in researching the history, this much became very clear to me in researching my book. Um, American indifference to soccer prior to 1990 doubled as an indifference to and an ignorance of international team sports generally. U.S. soccer could not grow its professional infrastructure. It could not appeal to broadcasters and advertisers. It could not enter the American sporting mainstream until it qualified for a World Cup, the biggest, richest, most effectively global sporting event on the planet, a competition whose guiding principle is, you know, its guiding principle and its stupendous fan appeal is precisely the international country versus country dynamic that was essentially unknown here. The indifference um, prior to 1990 also proved a cyclical failure of imagination. Now, what do I mean by that? We didn't get this international team sports dynamic and missing the World Cup every four years only reinforced it. It was something we did nine times between 1950 and 1990, and that meant that the light bulb could never go on. You know, every time we missed a World Cup, we had to wait four more years to try again, and the light bulb didn't go on, and it didn't go on, and it didn't go on. Um, as recently as 1986, when Mexico hosted its second World Cup right next door, most American sporting fans didn't care. And we didn't even know, I would say a big percentage of this country didn't even know we had a national soccer team. Um, soccer journalist Jim Trecker recognized the outlines and scope of this issue in the moment, and he verbalized it before anyone else. I quote him in Generation Zero. Americans didn't even comprehend how international tournaments were contested. People just didn't understand how Diego Maradona could play for his club, Napoli, and Argentina. Oh, I'm missing a photo. Oh, well. They couldn't get their heads around it. I'd say to them, think of it like baseball's all-star game. Somebody plays for the Yankees, but for this one day, they're going to represent the American League. This tournament is a month of that. This was the depth of the knowledge at the time. People would call me up asking where the game would be played, and I had to explain to them that the World Cup was actually 52 games played over 30 days. So how and why did all this change? The World Cup of 1990 itself played a pivotal role in showing Americans how fun and compelling international country versus country competition could be. Um, Bruce Murray was a striker on the 1990 national team um, that qualified for and competed at the uh, Italian World Cup. He also billeted in my house right over there on Dover Road back in 1976 when his youth soccer team traveled here to Wellesley for a big tournament. Bruce explained to me the effect of Italian 90 this way. The team that went to the Olympics in 88, then the World Cup, that team changed everything. We showed this country what worked. We showed this country what soccer was all about, how the world game worked. We even got the TV people at ESPN and TNT to care. So, you know, I'd love to claim, as Bruce claims, that the US qualified for the 1990 World Cup and that this single achievement changed everything overnight. But that's not really the way things work. Um, step by step, different events also met the changing moment. Um, one important driver was golf's Ryder Cup, which pits an American team of professional golfers against a team of European pros. Um, this event has you know, been around since 1927, but it didn't capture the public imagination until the mid-1980s, when our European opponents finally made the event competitive. Um, I'd bet the majority of American golf fans didn't even know that golf could accommodate a team competition, much less an international team competition. But um, they didn't really pay attention until we started losing these competitions to the Europeans. That changed everything. It sort of flipped a switch for golf in 1985. 
Um, there were other links in this um, rather slow moving chain reaction. In 1987, a still fledgling ESPN decided they were gonna cover the hell out of the America's Cup sailing regatta, um, live from Australia. Remarkably, US viewers started paying attention. I'm back on track. Very few Americans gave a damn about sailing in the 1980s and few give a damn today. But in February 1987, for the fourth and what proved to be the clinching match race between Kookaburra Three and Stars and Stripes, um, fully 1.9 million people watched um, on, a, on ESPN um, in the middle of the night. So now it was, it was about a 10 a.m., a 10 p.m. start. Um, I think this number, 1.9, is about how many households would watch a Duke UNC college basketball game in the same time slot. So ESPN was like, oh my God. Um, they learned that jingoism is a powerful thing. Later that year, still 1987, ESPN made a decision to televise qualification matches leading up to the soccer tournament at the 1988 Seoul Olympic Games. Um, was this a coincidence? I don't think so. I think they saw what was happening here. Interest in soccer at that point was preposterously low. They had no reason to, to televise the game for that reason. 18 months later, when the 1989 US men's national team finally did qualify for a World Cup, ESPN was there from April through November, televising every single match. For Americans though, I don't think the light would ever go on. Um, it wouldn't start blinking in, tele in Technicolor unless this dynamic was modeled by a major sport. Um, and for this development, we can thank the one and only John Thompson, Georgetown basketball coach for a long time, former Boston Celtic. He coached the 1988 men's Olympic basketball team stocked with college players. Um, and he coached them to a disappointing Olympic bronze medal at those same Seoul Summer Games. USA basketball and the NBA resolved pretty much right then and there to send professionals to the next Olympic Games. They didn't announce it, however, until two years after the disaster in Seoul and six months after the 1990 World Cup. Formation of the first dream team proved uh, a sensation from the moment Sports Illustrated put it on its cover. I think it was February 18, February 18, 1991. And um, hoopla about the dream team continues to fascinate Americans. Um, it prevailed right straight through the Barcelona Olympics in 92 to this day. And hockey wasted no time following suit. It resolved to send NHL professionals to the Olympics as well for 1994. Then the U.S. hosted Soccer's World Cup in 1994. And America's sporting imagination was, in many ways, effectively internationalized. We finally started to get it. All these examples are instructive for the same reason. I think it's important to point out. Losing where the chance of losing tends to make countries take a broader, more urgent view of sporting events generally, especially those involving national teams, and especially where it claims a type of ownership or hegemony in the sport. Basketball, for example, is something that we see intrinsically as American. We did invent it. Losing that game in 1988, the gold medal game, made us carry more, made us carry more about winning the next Olympic tournament more than, say, avenging a loss in water polo or soccer, where we don't feel the same sense of ownership. Uh, this is not an American dynamic, I think it's fair to say. Um, let me read here again from Generation Zero. America's attitude toward Olympic and international basketball prior to 1990 loosely mirrored the patronizing, proprietary way the English looked upon soccer played outside its borders until 1950. That was the year England first deigned to participate in soccer's World Cup. There they are right there. It had skipped the first three World Cups, judging the rest of the world unfit to compete with the English in a game the English had invented. Hmm. I think I'm missing a page. <laughs> Um, there was a, I don't know, the remainder of the quotes. My fingers are so dry, I can't be sure of it. Well, anyway. 
Um, this new understanding did prove revolutionary for American sport. International yachting hasn't exactly taken off, um, but golf has now a dozen separate international Ryder Cup style events um, because they all make huge amounts of money and garner all sorts of attention. The NHL and the NBA have only doubled down on their commitments to international play at the Olympics, at World Championships. The World Baseball Classic is coming back in 2023, this spring. Even the NFL is today playing games in London and Mexico City and Munich while reviving the idea of a European-based franchise, perhaps. But no U.S. sport has benefited more than soccer. Regular World Cup appearances have turned the men's and the women's national teams into 21st century cultural juggernauts. The 2026 World Cup will be held here. We are co-hosting the NAFTA World Cup with Mexico and Canada. Major League Soccer, founded in 1996, it sputtered along for a time, but it has truly come of age. I think it drew 10 million fans in 2022. That ranks it sixth among all soccer leagues in the world. It's pretty good. Um, U.S. networks televise MLS, but they annually invest billions in order to beam foreign league matches into our households. The richest, most prominent of those, um, the English Premier League, where fully half of the 20 clubs are owned by Americans. Some people feel soccer in 2022 has, in fact, already supplanted hockey in the country's big four sports. Um, soccer's ability to leverage internationalism is a major reason why. No other sport can really call on it in the same way. Um, let me conclude with another reading from Generation Zero, and then I'll be happy to take your questions if you have some. Um, here's the further irony. For most American soccer fans today, the World Cup has become the only soccer competition that truly matters. Yes, Major League Soccer has grown by leaps and bounds over its two plus decades. Um, the women's professional leagues have launched three of them. However, the U.S. men's national team and the U.S. women's national team each occupy an outsized place in the American so soccer tableau because sporting consumers here initially identified soccer with this country's national teams. First at Italia 90, then USA 94, and oh, by the way, when the women won the world title in 1991, they won again in 1999. Um, and they did this, this association took place because we didn't have any club teams to identify with because Major League Soccer hadn't started yet. Um, which of course I just explained to you even though it's written right there on the next line that I could have read because I wrote this. Uh, fan support is not a zero sum game. Nevertheless, in America, intense identification with its national team programs starting in 1990 has often meant less support for MLS and its franchises. This circumstance has, I think, been particularly damaging in the women's context where the US women's national team and its exposure and success have essentially starved domestic leagues, even the current National Women's Soccer League, from exposure and success. What's more, this phenomenon remains peculiarly American. Germans and Chileans and Japanese and South Africans, they all adore their respective national teams. However, in those three years between World Cups, they go mad following their respective domestic competitions as well. Americans are still developing this infatuation for domestic soccer between quadrennials. Did the programmers at ESPN sense this pending shift in the American media zeitgeist, one that so effectively mobilized our not insignificant jingoism? Did a basketball bronze medal in Seoul ultimately enable the mainstream of soccer in the 1990s? It's hard to make these claims in a definitive fashion. U.S. basketball fans have been pining for an NBA participation. They've been pining for NBA participation in the Olympics since 1972, when another gold medal went begging. However, looking back and looking closely, we can say this. The 1990 U.S. men's national soccer team arrived at exactly the right time, just when Americans were right to recognize how irresistible international team competitions could be. And that is my talk for this evening. Um, if you have questions and want to talk soccer, let's do it now. Why do you think the women's national team is so successful and the men's not? 
Well, we're talking about this at a really interesting time because I think the women started out, they only formed the women's national team in 1985, which is ridiculously late, even considering Title IX it was, you know, what, 1972? But the moment they formed that team, our team was world beaters. They were the best in the world immediately. Now, why was that? The women's collegiate system was really strong, and it existed nowhere else in the world. So um, my bet is that because that infrastructure was already in place, we had a huge leg up on the rest of the world. So they were immediately world champions and have won, what, four World Cups. But now, the rest of the world has caught up. And the reason they've caught up is that the academy system that actually develops players in the men's game and the women's game um, started in Europe. They know how it works, and they've now applied that technology, if you will, to the women's game. So the European countries have gained on the women here in the last three or four years in a huge way. And um, I think the World Cup that is going to take place in Australia and New Zealand in the summertime next year is going to uh, an expose. It's going to expose a new reality. I think. Do you think it was sexism that basically uh, forget about the women, only the men are important. I, how can that not be a factor? Yeah. But um, one of the things I talk about in the book is that I mean, Wellesley High School didn't even have a varsity soccer team until 1978. We played soccer, a bunch of guys here I played, grew up playing with. We played with a guy named David Gregg. Um, his sister, Lori Gregg, graduated from Wellesley High School in 1978, and she couldn't play varsity soccer here until 1978. She played field hockey as a junior and a sophomore. And that's what, seven years after Title IX, I'm shocked that we didn't add a varsity soccer team before then. I mean, we grew up playing you know, youth soccer in this town, side by side, boys and girls from the age of 10, I was talking to Tom Wellington, who's in this book quite a bit, by the way. It's another reason to pick it up. Um, we were too young to pay attention to who was at the on fields next to us when we were 10. But by the time we were 12, we're like, every time we went to practice, there was a girls' team playing next to us. We scrimmaged them. We scrimmaged older teams. I mean, they were everywhere. So when we, the idea that there was no varsity soccer team was crazy. But Lori Gregg went to college with my sister at Lehigh. She graduated in 1978. She went to Lehigh and played on the men's JV because there was no women's program, college level. Um, transferred to UNC and was on their first um, national championship team. She was on the very first women's national team in 1985. That, that blows me away too, that there was no women's team until 1985, but our men's national team program was so weak and unknown it, it's a little more understandable to me that they wouldn't have started it until then. So, Al, we, we obviously were teammates for a decade here growing up in Wellesley. Wellesley's produced many great soccer players, including Alicia Carrillo, who went on to be a superstar at Harvard University. Um, but let's talk about... Honeywell School product. Mm -hmm. And you were also part of a team that, from Wellesley that won the McGuire Cup championship and went to the Eastern, uh, Eastern Region Finals. Tell us, tell us how that all ties into some of the people who ended up in the 1990 World Cup team that you and I know. Sure. So in 1976, our U-12 team won the States, and we beat some team from New York, and we ended up hosting this team from Bethesda, Maryland, to come up here. And that's where Bruce Murray, let me see if I can get back to the beginning here. Oh, I like that picture. Bruce Murray is right here. He was the all-time leading scorer for the men's national team for many, many years. He is the one who stayed at my house. Another for future national team player, John Kerr, stayed at Tom's house. Um, they killed us. They really, they wiped us out. Um, but we did keep running into these guys because they would invariably running, you know, we played the McGuire Cup, the U19 tournament, we won the States, we played a team from Northern Virginia, they beat us, and a bunch of those guys played on the national team. So we kept running into these guys who were really good, and they were all from points south. And when we were 12, we thought, 
wow, it must be the climate. They must be able to play year round, you know? There's gotta be some reason these guys are so good because we're awesome. How can they be so much better than us? They must be playing all year round and we can't. But no, actually what it was was they had access to really good coaching um, from a young age and uh, we largely did not. <laughs> but, you know, there's so much going on with, we played against them in college. I guess one of the things that I, that I would still marvel at is that I didn't really put two and two together. I didn't realize these guys were the same age as me until I was watching them on TV in 1990. And they would say, oh, Bruce Murray is, you know, born in 1965. And I was like, oh, well, oh. <laughs> For whatever reason, it never really clicked. But uh, I don't know. I don't feel I answered your question very well, Tom. Is there anything more specific? Yeah, I mean, there are so many anecdotes that I mean, we could tell stories all night about our, uh, our soccer playing days. But I think it all, as, as you pointed out, it all started at Honeywell School. Right. And That's the important thing. Right. I did. I should say that um, uh, when we we won the states in 1980, but I don't think that we knew that there was a team that actually went to the state final um, from Wellesley High School in 1974. Um, Rick Copeland is here tonight, and he coached us back in the day. Your brother played on that team, and Wellesley lost the state final on corner kicks. They were tied, and they compared how many corner kicks each team had, and the team that had more corner kicks was named not just the winner of the game, but the state champion. I learned that in researching this book. Couldn't find a way to work it in. It didn't seem relevant, but it still sort of blows me away. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, during World War II, I lived in Dallas, Texas, and I played soccer. When I came back to New England, they'd never heard of soccer. Mm -hmm. That seems kind of amazing. Why would Dallas, Texas be promoting soccer in their public schools? Well, I think probably because they were full of Hispanic kids Maybe. whose families were very familiar with soccer. That'd be my guess. That's true. One of the things that 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 you under you know sort of figure out when you're looking at the history of soccer in this country is that even in 1984, when things were their darkest, there were probably 25 or 30 million soccer fans in this country but they were spread over the country in a thin way. There were pockets of urban interest, mainly kept alive by immigrant populations or second or third generation populations. And, but that, you know, 25 million people is a lot of people. I'm in the golf business and there's 25 million golfers in America today, so it's not nothing. But they were spread around in a way that never could be coalesced or there was, and there was no way for them to watch anything on television together and get a Nielsen rating for it. So it was this, it wasn't a ghost population, but it was a very hard to identify population. So, but I think all the immigrant influence that existed in this country, um, if there probably were people playing soccer in Boston at that time, in Philadelphia at that time, but they only played it in Philadelphia um, amongst themselves. There certainly was nobody playing soccer in the suburbs. That's really what changed in the 70s. It got moved to the suburbs, frankly, when a lot of the folks who had been in this country for a couple generations in those cities um, moved to the suburbs. They had been here long enough, they'd established themselves. They bought a Levittown house and moved out there and they brought soccer with them. Almost all of the hotbeds that I write about in the couple, in the opening chapters, um, had an individual who started a youth soccer organization in the 70s. Um, it was usually he and they were invariably um, an Englishman or a Mexican or a Chilean. Here, it was Ray Copeland and um, I'm not sure that, and Jocelyn Paul, Jocelyn Paul's mom, I can't remember her name. They, she started the fall soccer program here and um, Ray Copeland started the club soccer and um, you needed that boost to get it going. But once it got suburbanized, it became totally associated 
with the suburbs. It was associated for decades with these immigrant populations in these cities. They were, they were sort of foreign and a little scary and other. Um, then they moved to the suburbs and everyone made fun of them for being too white bread because that's definitely the rap on soccer now. <laughs> it's funny how it moves. Mm -hmm. It was a long time ago, and Starco was being introduced into St. Louis, and I watched the, the first exhibition game by Pele in the Bush Stadium in St. Louis. And we had just come to this country, and I worked at the British Consulate right there by Bush Stadium, and we saw the first exhibition game by Pele. And that was in the 60s? Yeah, so Pele um, got famous here in the 70s when he played for the Cosmos, but I learned that he and his club team, there was Brazilian club team Santos, they toured all over America during the 60s. They'd come up and do exhibitions in St. Louis, which was a notable hotbed of soccer in the country. Milwaukee, they would go to Milwaukee because they knew they could get a crowd there. So these populations of soccer fans did exist. Um, but uh, no one paid attention to them until they started playing <laughs> youth soccer and started taking money from football programs and what have you. Um, yes, Rick. Uh, Kelly and Santos played in Fenway Park in 68. That's right. I think they played there when the Red Sox were at the All-Star game. And um, I remember, I, it's, in, it's in the book because um, the Globe was sort of notorious for undercounting the people who showed up to these games. And the reason they did it was that they were, the media was sort of, they were protective of our four traditional sports. They would, they would say, well, there were, you know, several hundred people at the game, you know, involving, you know, Santos and the Boston Beacons, I think they played that day. Um, but then you have these, these guys, um, there's a guy named Frank Mirasola who was a referee at one of these games and he, complained to a colleague of mine, you know, another journalist, and he's like, I was at that game. There were 10,000 people there. I counted the tickets. You know, <laughs> he felt very aggrieved at the way the media downplayed soccer for a long time. And St. Louis was a, a huge hotbed for soccer. And when I was just out of college and starting to pay attention to the national team, um, that was because it was finally on TV, um, I noticed they played games at this tiny little field in Fenton, Missouri. Now, I didn't know that Fenton, Missouri was a suburb of St. Louis until I looked into it. Uh, but I'm like, why would they play there? Well, first of all, St. Louis is a, a hotbed of soccer. But they played there because they knew they could sell it out with Americans. Because before this time, they would hold a game at the Rose Bowl, and 80,000 Mexicans would show up, and they'd lose. So they were trying to find places that had enough Americans who cared so that they could sell it out and actually have home field advantage. It was very difficult to, to wangle until about 1992 when they started to find, you know, Gen X had, Gen Zero had come of age. They would start showing up to these games, but not until then. It was a very tricky deal. Dave, go ahead. Oh, all, all sorts of things. Um, I, do, I was surprised that none of the guys on the, on the team had any idea about the history themselves. All they knew was their little narrow experience. Even though they, they were doing national, you know, national team, youth team stuff, you know, by the time they were 16 and 17, they really had no idea. <clears throat> I was amazed at how, con you know, the North American Soccer League had a quota. They had a rule that said you had to have two Americans on the field at all times. And you know, this makes sense, right? You want to build the game here. You want to put locals out on the field and so people can aspire to them. And we did exactly that. You know, Kids my age, we loved Benny Brewster and Shep Messing, and they played for the Minutemen, and they were living gods to us. But when you only have two Americans on the field, they usually played them. At, at left fullback and goalie. So um, when it came time to play national you know, team games, we had nobody who played in the middle of the field. We had no skill players because they were all playing goalie. I interviewed a guy from St. Louis 
who's an old timer, he's actually older than gen the Generation Zero guys. And he said the joke was, um, amongst NASL coaches in the 70s was, um, this quota thing sucks. I mean, how are you supposed to play two goalkeepers? <laughs> That's the way they thought. But, but everyone, no, no, one, no one sort of thought that the NASL was hindering us um, at the time. And it seemed clear to me that it did. And when I got digging into it enough, I found people who actually <laughs> agreed with this assessment. But, you know, it was the National League. It was all we had. People weren't prepared to crap on it. They actually added a guy. It was, it was a quota of three starting in 1980. And you know, the league died in three years. I mean, so that surprised me. There were so many things, Dave. It was like a, a real eye-opener. And the hard thing was limiting it at some point to a period of time because the history of the game in this country is so weird and anomalous. Um, but other people have written about, you know, soccer in the 20s and at the turn, you know, you know, turn of the century. I figured I had to limit it somehow. I have so much to say. Um, my whole life has been uh, blessed with soccer and relationships with soccer. Um, I, I did want to come back to you and said, you know, Bruce Murray and John Kerr, those folks had real coaches, right, as, as youth players. And I just have to give a shout out to the folks that stepped up, um, you know, raked the yard in the morning and then came and coached the girls and the boys. And um, my dad, Angel Carrillo, went to the Wellesley Free Library to get Ray Copeland's book on how to coach soccer. <laughs> uh, you know, um, so there's, there's a wonderful legacy of volunteerism in youth soccer. You know, my dad coached me. Um, I coached my kids, so I was a little further along having grown up. You know, my kids, I, my son was coached by Bruce Murray and John Kerr and Robbie Musto. And to see the, the layered growth um, through the youth soccer system, building into clubs, certainly, and um, has been uh, just tremendously rewarding. And, and, so, and so grateful for folks who care enough about the game and realize the national and international importance it's had and by writing books and doing research. And, and coming together in, at um, settings like this. Um, I don't know. I love it. Love the game. <laughs> love you back. The, uh, there are so many generations that are involved in the story, and that was another reason I wanted to call the book what I did. But you know, two of them are really important. One generation, they're both generations that came before Generation Zero. The first one was the baby boom. And the North American Soccer League was basically created for them. Um, when you're trying to start a new league in America, you know, what are you going to aim it at? Not a bunch of kids in the 70s. You're aiming it at young adults who are, in fact, very rebellious and non-traditional, who are the, you know, it's the biggest cohort of Americans ever produced in terms of number. You're aiming something like that at the baby boom. And they just didn't care. They got into Pele for a couple years, then they left it for dead. And these are the people, I think, those of us in Gen X can agree. You know, we've lived our whole lives in the shadow of these people. <laughs> and we've lived our lives, you know, sort of living with their decisions about what they like and don't like. So as a result of their not liking soccer, they sort of dropped the whole experiment in our laps. So that was one thing. But the other thing, to your point, Alicia, is, you know, the other generation that was so important was the silent generation, our parents. I mean, they were the people that coached us. There was no one else to do it because no one knew the game. They didn't, knew, they didn't know the game either, but they had kids who needed coaching. So, you know, a lot of them, we, we laugh about, you know, our coach, we had a coach named Vince Harakevich. He was known as H, because no one could say or spell Harakevich. Um, and he didn't know anything about soccer. He, you know, had a big Vista Cruiser station wagon, and he brought oranges and juicy fruit for halftime. That was his role. But, you know, without him, where would we be? So, you know, my hat was off to all of them in this book. They were really heroes in their own way. And there were so many of them who just had no idea. Dibs.
seem to have more than more than half the starting lineup in North African descent to Don and just like you and these guys. And and they were national heroes for Mantra. That whole fast forward to today, I'd love to just beyond generations here, your thoughts on you know this the the, the, the politics of immigration dialogue enter into our national team, into our roster, into players that that choose to be here or not. Do you have, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean there's there's a lot going on there. Um, within the soccer community, I think the feeling is that the American national team program, especially on the men's side, but I think it's true for the women as well, they don't have nearly as much Latin Hispanic influence as they should have. It, there's still actually an amazingly few players on the roster that has gone to um, Qatar of Hispanic descent. How, how can that be? Um, they can't all be playing for Mexico. There are a lot of them who do. Um, but that's, that's one part of it. Um, the other part of it is that I guess I'm heartened by the fact that it's not an issue anymore with soccer. It used to be that soccer was held up as this thing that was really not very American. And the idea of adding even more sort of immigrant influence to it would have been sort of kryptonite, but now it doesn't feel that way. And it, it is such a hot button issue in every other regard. I think, I think it speaks to how much soccer has become part of the fabric of the country. It's just not controversial anymore that soccer is this, this game that is played by everyone and played by people who arrive here immediately, played by people who are suburban and white bread. It, you know, it just doesn't matter anymore. The French, you know, they were, they are the best example too in a competitive sense. They have blended, you know, their team in a way that we should aspire to because we don't, I'm not sure that Americans really see soccer in themselves. I'm not sure that we have a, a real style at this point that we can fall back on. It's, I think when you're a melting pot, it's dip, more difficult to do. But the fact that the French have done it and the Dutch have done it shows that it can be done. Um, and then you get back to the question about whether they need to be coached by an American. That's this, it's not an American idea though. Almost every country is coached by someone who is a citizen of the country. Um, and that's, it sounds sort of prejudicial, but it probably has merit. I don't know. Um, it's, such a, it's such a broad issue, but it's got to work to our advantage. It, it, it should work to our advantage competitively. And I don't think it has yet. John? Oh, get your so, keys. Um, uh, first of all, congratulations on the book. Thanks. I also, uh, I think I told you, I'm um, excited to a friend of mine who's the same generation as you and uh, grew up playing soccer and has uh, uh, never really sort of abandoned it. I think is this the Liverpool guy? Pardon me? Is this the Liverpool guy or is that you? I'm the Liverpool guy. Oh, okay. Guy. He's a man you guy. Okay, okay. Yeah, let's not talk about that. <laughs> I bought him a Marino t shirt. <laughs> So I really like your thesis, which is that soccer sort of made the U.S. Um, uh, into a country that could appreciate um, men's uh, uh, team international sport. And um, uh, kind of in a way that we can't um, through the Olympics and maybe tennis and other sports like that, which are um, and uh, I think one of the interesting uh, things about that thesis is that what it invites us to do, or what it sort of forces us to do, is to think about a sport in which we are not superior, yeah. or you know what I mean, where we don't, where we don't have uh, any kind of a tradition of excellence, and as you say, we don't really have an identity, and. Um, So one of the things that I, that I think I really like about you know soccer being in this position is that it kind of gives us this dose of humility in sports that really we don't really have right. in any other sport. I wonder if you see it that way. I do. Yeah. Um, I certainly have a lot of friends, many of them residents of the far left, who really believe that 
soccer, you know, America does not need to be good at soccer. We don't need to be good at this. We don't need to be good at everything. And they are sort of offended that now we're, we're good at it and we aspire to these levels of excellence um, that are sort of expected. Americans expect that from their teams. So I think soccer actually lived um, quite well. They dined out, if you will, for a long time on the fact that we were underdogs and you don't often get to root for America as an underdog. Um, yeah, that's changing a little bit. Um, and then the women's example is completely different. So they had both aspects of it. Well, I said men. Yes. I think we also have to learn, you know, the, the men have had to learn from the women. Yes. The excellence of the women's too. Absolutely. Yeah. But now I think the women are going to learn from the men because I think the rest of the world has caught the women's national team. And they're going to have to fight for World Cups just like everyone else now. So that's going to be interesting to watch. But I think you're absolutely right. Um, oh, I had something cogent to say, but it slipped away. Anyway, I really... <laughs> I like the way you kind of dropped, dropped all this in the lap of uh, us baby boomers. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Um, You're one of the nicest baby boomers I know, John. Probably the only one. No, no, that's not true. There are a lot of them. <laughs> Keys, you had one. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the book, Al. Great read. Um, really enjoyed it. Uh, so uh, where do we go from here? Like, like we have this whole arc from from when we were kids to where we are now. Mm -hmm. right? and, but we have this whole pool of uh, soccer players now who have come up, grown up, like generations, maybe two or three generations. Ago. It's like, where does soccer go in the country now? Like, what defines success? Well, now I think we can aspire to, to win things. And the team that has gone to Qatar is, is the best team that we've ever assembled, for sure. Um, and that's just not my gut feeling. Never have we put a team together that has so many players playing for the top clubs in Europe. That's just never happened. Um, even when we, we did well in 2010 and 2014 and 2002, um, they weren't playing for these clubs. They, the couple of them might have been playing in Europe, but they were playing for small clubs and, or they were playing in MLS. This is a whole new era. I don't know the answer to that, obviously. I mean, I think that it's going to be a different challenge for them um, to deal with expectation. And that'll be uh, very interesting to watch in four years when we host the World Cup, when all the, this team that we have now is so young. I think it's the second youngest in the tournament. Only Ghana is younger than our team. But we're loaded. Um, they may not you know, win anything this time, but they're going to be four years older and having played in all those foreign leagues with top clubs for four years, they're going to be in their primes, plus another wave of talent to join them for 2026. They could conceivably get to a semifinal and do some things. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I was watching some schlocky, like, World Cup highlight show on TV the other night, and uh, there was a top 10 saves in the World Cup feature. And... They showed one of Landon Donovan in 2002 being robbed um, by Oliver Kahn, the German goalkeeper, um, in the quarterfinal. So it's important to remember that we had a team in 2002 that played in a World Cup quarterfinal and could have won that game. That save is just insane. You've got to look it up on YouTube. Um, we had a penalty kick that wasn't given to us. Well, that, that game could have been won, and Germany was the World Cup finalist. So things can happen right now. I mean, the, the, the United States could actually go to a quarterfinal or semifinal this year. You just never know. Um, I guess the fun thing for me, Keys, is that soccer is, is the World Cup is the hardest thing to win. Um, there are such established soccer nations that have never come even as close as we have to winning. And they still love it. They still follow it for all of this disease, you know, stuff I was talking about tonight. It does something for us as a member of this country just to have them there. Look at the Welsh who we play on Monday. They're, they're happy just to be there. Like, they couldn't be happier. If they win against, then they get to play England. They just don't really even care about us. But there are so many levels of achievement at a World Cup that 
would make a, a country perfectly happy to have participated, maybe to win a game or to score a goal. There are teams that have never scored at a World Cup. There are teams that never get out of a group. There are these different steps. And I don't know, I guess I don't worry about it because it's such an interesting kaleidoscope of you know, entertainment for me and for soccer fans, no matter what happens. And if the US crashes out, there's still a bunch of other great teams I can, I can watch. Um, but I do think that this is the best team we've ever sent, and we haven't seen the best from them. Our midfield, we never had a midfield like this. Musa, McKenney, and um, Adams. We've just never had three guys that good. You should probably mention next Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, USA versus England. And my point is that if the U.S. beats England, the, the, the country that founded the game of football and soccer, uh, that's, that's good enough. Yeah, we're unbeaten, actually, against England in World Cup competition. We've beaten them and tied them. We've never lost to them. You had a question in the back. Well, this is a big country, so I, I don't worry about that. Um, I think soccer has already passed hockey, has already supplanted hockey amongst the big four for the reasons we talked about tonight. Hockey doesn't have an international dynamic like soccer does. Um, we don't care about the Russian league. That's probably the second best hockey league in the world is Russia's. Even before this militarism, um, we didn't care about that league. We don't care about the Swedish league. Um, the Swedish league might watch the NHL, but we don't beam Swedish league games here because no one cares about hockey that much. Hockey is a regional sport in this country. The entire top half of the country cares quite a lot about hockey. I love hockey. I'm a mass hole, born and bred. I love hockey. I love the Bruins. But no one in Tampa cares about hockey. Um, and they're never going to play hockey growing up in the southern part of this country. Um, and the other part, the other, so that internationalism is something that, that a competitive sport like hockey can't really compete with us on. Um, but the other thing is the unisexuality of soccer. There, the, no one cares about women's hockey. People care about women's soccer in this country. So no other sport that we'd be competing against in this way for eyeballs and hearts and minds has a men's incarnation and a women's incarnation that are, you know, both so popular and are just going to get more popular. Um, so. There's a, a guy that I quote in the book named Andre Markovitz. He's a, an academic, and he wrote a book in 2001 called Offside, Soccer and American Exceptionalism. And he has this theory that a nation's sporting space is limited and that you know, the, the positions in that sporting space are really determined 100 years ago when the Industrial Revolution really took off. And if you look at it closely, that is the way it worked here. Football and baseball established themselves during that time. Basketball got in in the 20th century because it's an American game. And hockey has never really been an American game, but it was sort of the also ran. He actually refers to it as the big three and a half because he always thought hockey was ripe for the plucking. And I think um, it's been plucked. It's a free talk, Alicia. <laughs> no, just so we're, I think that soccer is fortunate in that no matter how the men do this year, um, it's coming to America, right? So the World Cup is coming to America. Mm -hmm. um, what, in four years? 2026. That's amazing. Um, and so there's still going to be some opportunity, right, for life of the game, et cetera. And I don't know, we're talking about, you know, the market share of sports. How 
much in your research? How much did money come up? So how, how much of it is in the development of, of players, or just generally? In the popularity of the sport in America, like how much of it is tied to the bottom line? I how would money meaning? Right? Yeah. And I think of the money that goes into just promoting the sport. Right. And just even the TV. Think of the TV rights you talked about oh, yeah. earlier. Yeah. Like that is, there's so much money. Yes, there is. You, you think that's a, a never, you think there's a, a ceiling to that? I don't think there is a ceiling. No, I don't, I don't either. And um, j let me tie these together. Um, last year, um, the NHL, um, was paid $675 million by TNT, CBS, to televise NHL regular season games and the playoff game. So the whole season, everything, $675 million. Um, if you total up all the different streaming and broadcasting um, of MLS, NWSL, um, Liga MX, all the foreign leagues that are beamed in here, the total is about $1.5 billion. So Already, not soccer fans like me, but broadcasters are making a decision about what Americans want to watch. They're willing to spend three times what they pay to broadcast the National Hockey League right now. And I think that there's growth there. I mean, I, I can see a lot more being spent to broadcast women's soccer, for example, um, Mexican League. Mexican League isn't even included in those numbers because they sell their rights individually per team, which is crazy. So that's one thing. But the other thing that did come up, I was talking to Jim Gabara, who was on the U.S. national team in 1989. Um, NESCAC product, Connecticut product. Um, he's a coach, coached in all three iterations of Women's Soccer League um, in this country. And his point is the money is actually keeping people from the money in the development process of as players is really very sticky. In Europe, if you're good, you go and play at the Barcelona Academy, and you don't pay for that to happen. Barcelona pays for that because they're developing talent for their club. Here in America, capitalism is ruining the development process because there's all these premier league, you know, these elite clubs, then premier, they call it premier soccer. And parents are obliged to pay for that service. And they're basically selling dreams. I mean, how do you tell a kid and a parent that you're not good enough to be on this team anymore when they're paying you $10,000 a year for the privilege? That's the problem with the system here. Even the academy system that we have adopted finally, and we didn't do it until about 2006, um, it's not fully that way. You still pay to be in the New England Revolution's academy. Um, They've got to drop that because that expectation of payment from the player um, is limiting the people who can play. You are limiting the talent you're going to get because only the people who have enough money to pay um, can do it. Um, I was on some chat with this woman at the, on, I guess it was on Facebook, and she was like, how do, we, how do I tell my kid that they're never going to play for the women's national team because I'm not going to pay for her to be on this team. How do you say that to your kid? Um, I don't know how, I don't know the answer to that question. I just know that the system that requires you to pay is twisted. I mean, we had no system for so long, it's hard to complain, but now that we are a mature football nation, we need to start thinking about this stuff because it's, uh, it's a bit of a dead end. The soccer industrial thank you. <laughs> Yes. Sure. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> it is a little bit quarter after eight. Anybody else have any questions? Hey, thanks so much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. It's good fun. And I guess I'm going to sign these books whether people want to buy them or not, because then they'll take them back to Wellesley Books and sell them for a huge price, because of course I've signed them. <laughs> But um, if anyone brought their book, I'm happy to sign them and chat afterwards. I think, courtesy of Rick Copeland, we're going to go to the club. So after is at the Italo-American Club on Pleasant Street, if you're interested.